Today I wanted to start this video off by covering a really fundamental topic that not a lot of people I don't see talking about this really anywhere and um, it's going to impact a lot of people guys. So when it comes to condo owners, this is a big problem here in Florida, but this can happen to you anywhere. So if you own a condo pretty much anywhere in the world, something like this could probably end up happening to you. And this latest story about condo terminations is covering an 88 unit building in Bell Harbor, which is right up the street. They got approached by a developer to buy up the entire building. Here's a quick rundown on how something like this could work. All condos have bylaws and in the bylaws, it says somewhere in there, what are the parameters or the conditions that need to be met for a developer to basically seize control of the building. And in this building in Bell Harbor, the bylaws stated that any one entity or person needs to own at least 80% of the units in order to take the place over, okay? And this story revolves around this couple that they were holding out, like they didn't want to sell the unit, okay? So basically how these buyouts work is the developer will approach a few people in the community with a buyout and then they'll go from there and try to just buy out more and more of the units until they reach a majority stronghold that they need to to terminate the condo, which in this case was 80%. But unfortunately for this couple, it was only them and five other people that were holdouts. And so the developer was able to gain control of the condo and ultimately they were forced to sell their units to the developer even though they didn't want to. So in a building like this, for example, in our, in our video here, if there's say 20 units here and the rule is 80%, then a developer would need to end up owning 16 of these units in order to take full control of the building, essentially. And these people are pissed because they were forced to sell their unit, they no longer have an ocean view, and they ended up buying a house that was half the size of their old condo. So not only do they have less space than before, but you know, imagine getting kicked out at a time like this when real estate prices here in South Florida are at all time highs and you know, your money doesn't go nearly as far as it did three years ago. So that's not really a great position to be in right now. And so far over the past decade, there have been about 400 condo terminations just in Florida alone. And the number one reason for these condo terminations is because developers will target these buildings that are in very desirable areas where the land value is massive. And in this example, uh, this building is located right on the ocean in Bell Harbor, so prime real estate location. And these developers obviously stand to make a fortune by tearing down these old buildings. And even if they pay the current owners of the place double fair market value, which is pretty common, I've seen them do that here several times already, that's still nothing in comparison to the profits that they stand to make once they redevelop the site and turn it into a brand new property. And I have multiple examples of this on my channel. In fact, I'll put up this video I made a while ago. Go check this out and you'll see the perfect example of another building here in Miami Beach that this is happening to right now. And the thing is, some unit owners look at this as a blessing, especially after the Surfside collapse. And now that we have these new condo laws that are going to be going into effect starting as of 2025, you know, a lot of these old buildings that have 40 years of deferred maintenance, they can have a $100,000 special assessment without blinking an eye, guys. It's happening all over the place. In fact, I just covered one about a week or two ago, this huge story in Miami where they're trying to get people to pay $175,000 per unit special assessment, which is totally insane. And even though they're being ripped off, okay, and it was proven that the estimates for this were highly overinflated and they got another estimate for half the money. Still, imagine having a special assessment on your unit for like, what, $85,000? That's still a lot of money, guys, no matter which way you slice it. So people who are in this position, especially in the next few years where the building is really underwater financially, these are gonna be prime targets for these developers. I am telling you right now, you're gonna see buyouts like you've never seen before. And yeah, maybe some unit owners look at this as a blessing because they're able to get a lot of money for their place and just move on, right? But like the couple in this story, these guys are in their 80s, guys. When you're 80 years old, 
you don't exactly want to pick up and move and start all over. You're thinking, you know, this is going to be my forever home. I'm going to die in this place. And then, surprise, the building gets bought out and you got to move. So this is a big problem. But there's going to be no end in sight with this. I can guarantee you that. This is going to continue to be a real big issue here moving forward as more buildings just don't have the money to pay for the necessary reserve that they need to have as well as the repairs that they're going to have to do as well. And another thing that's happening with this is there was another story similar to this one of a guy in Boca Raton and he was the only person to hold out in his condo complex that was offered a buyout of 176 units, okay? So one person out of 176, but his bylaws said that 100% of the people need to agree to the buyout for any entity or developer to take over. So you would think, all right, well, this guy's holding out, so they're not gonna be able to take over because one person refuses to sell. Not so fast. Of course, these guys have deep pockets and they have ways around this. They will hire attorneys to help solve this issue. And what they'll do is once they've taken control of the majority is pass a motion and change the bylaws to where they only needed to have 80% of the entire building to be bought out. And therefore him being the only holdout ended up being meaningless in the end. And I can pretty much guarantee you that's gonna be the same story we're gonna hear over and over again when it comes to a lot of these condo terminations. Ah, the good old overpriced rental. I don't know how many times we've run into this situation here in Miami. Just another three bed, three and a half bath house from a hundred years ago that's $15,000 a month. And it's not even a flip or anything like that. The owner bought this place back in 1998 for 280 grand. So they've held this place for a long time, but this rental price, let me tell you, Let's see if they ever get anybody in here. And so basically this guy who was the lone holdout in Boca Raton is taking this situation to court trying to sue because he feels like his property rights were violated and that home ownership shouldn't be something that can just be voted away. And in another instance of this in Melbourne, Florida, there was a woman who was offered 180,000 for her unit and that was not enough to pay for something comparable in the area. And this is a great example of a developer not paying the, somebody double of what the place is actually worth to give them a real incentive to leave. So this is basically worst case scenario. This is even worse than being the lone holdout is not getting enough money to even buy something else in the area. And so this poor woman, she's 70 years old, decided to take the buyout because she received a letter from the developer saying, listen, if you don't accept our $180,000 buyout now, every year that you hold out, our offer will go down by $20,000. So if you wait a year, the new offer is gonna be 160. Year two, new offer is gonna be 140. So obviously, when you're older like this, and this is your retirement home, you don't wanna be losing this kind of money. So she caved in, she took the buyout, and what she ended up doing is she had to use all of her savings plus the money she got from this buyout to buy a single family home for 315,000 in the area. And this is the shape of things to come here. And some of the people in this complex are deciding to sue this developer as well. But if it turns out anything like the other one, they're probably gonna end up losing because these developers have millions of dollars just to throw down the drain on attorney's fees and just drag these things out and make it impossible for people. And this lady's advice at the end was never buy a condo in Florida because it can be taken away from you. But like I said in the beginning, this can happen anywhere, guys. But the reason it's happening so much here now is because a lot of these buildings here are very old. We have you know, more coastline than any other state except for Alaska, I think. So we are surrounded by the ocean. There are thousands and thousands of buildings here that are ripe for redevelopment. And not only that, but obviously the national trend of how many people are moving here is giving developers huge incentives to buy down here in Florida and try to turn these places around because there's a lot of money in this. And I've even thought about this myself, like as a condo owner here living in a condo, I often wonder like, what would I do in this situation? Like, obviously I would want to get a pretty penny for the place, but I really wouldn't want to sell it. I don't have any intentions of selling the place. It is my home. And if I was forced to sell like one of these situations and, you know, take the money and, and move, 
I mean, it's a huge disruption in your life, guys. One of the main reasons besides the cost of ownership being now lower than the rent here that I bought this place was also so I don't have to move anymore. And that right could be taken away from me as well. And I certainly wouldn't be happy about it, even if I got double what I paid for the place. That still doesn't really solve that problem. You're stuck with this huge inconvenience of moving at a time in your life when you thought you were going to be, you know, having some stability, when in fact it can be quite the opposite. Of course, if anything like that ever does happen to me, I'll be sure to keep you guys posted, but I'm hoping that it doesn't, at least for now. And speaking of Florida, there was this new study done about property that's in flood zones and it's been reported now and estimated there's so many properties in a flood zone across the United States and even in Florida in particular that this real estate that's located in the flood zones is estimated to be overvalued to the tune of about 237 billion dollars with a B. Just here in Florida we make up 50 billion of that number so that's a pretty big chunk out of the entire country and what they're saying here is that these properties need to be reevaluated because if they are in these flood zones, then that should severely impact the value of the property of what somebody should pay and ultimately will affect the tax base of the local government and how much they can charge on property taxes if these properties were to actually be reevaluated. And what they're doing is some states are looking at passing laws where now the flood zone needs to be part of the disclosure process in the home sale. Like for example, recently North Carolina, the real estate commission there, just proposed a petition to make sure that people who are buying properties there are informed of whether or not this is a flood zone and this is disclosed before the purchase goes through. But you know what? I don't see governments doing anything about this especially because think about this for a minute. What incentive does the government have to make sure that people get disclosed whether or not a property is in a flood zone and this ultimately affects the resale value of the property? You know, governments don't want to see real estate values go down because like we said earlier, this is going to affect how much they can collect in property taxes from people who live in the area. And I don't see what government is going to voluntarily let go of a bunch of their property tax base, which is a large portion of their income. So I think the odds of something like this happening nationwide, where a bunch of states start passing laws where you have to disclose if the property's in a flood zone, fat chance, guys. Once again, it's one of those things where you need to do your own diligence, you need to do your own research. And just a heads up on this, when you're doing your research, people look at the FEMA maps, which makes sense. That's the best resource we have. But you have to understand that sometimes these FEMA maps are just outdated. They don't apply anymore. Okay, so that's the other problem with this. And the other thing is too, is that flood zones are constantly changing, especially in hurricane prone areas. Like here in Florida, for example, when we had Hurricane Ian hit, it forever changed the flood zones there. Like areas that weren't expected to flood during the hurricane did get flooded. And you know, when you have this massive amount of water move through an area, it can change the landscape enough where it can make areas that used to flood not flood anymore and vice versa. So FEMA maps are a good place to start, but ultimately, you know, that could be outdated. So it's a tricky situation. Now I saw this other story today that I just had to bring up here on the channel. And here's the headline from this story. It says real estate investors will save the US housing market from a crash. Now, right away, when I first read that, my literally my first thought, my first impression was, why would investors jump in and save the housing market from a crash? In fact, it's in investors' best interest to wait until property values have sunken significantly and then swoop in and buy up these properties at pennies on the dollar. That's what happened last time around, and I don't see why that wouldn't happen again this time around. And just for them to already come out and say that investors are going to rush in and save the housing market from a crash sounds like just a total joke to me. And you know who's behind this? Grant Cardone. He's the one that said this, that, you know, firms like mine are going to come in and save the day, essentially. So, you know, homeowners don't have to worry about their home price crashing right now because once it drops by enough, we'll come in and pick it up from you. <laughs> and this is exactly what he said verbatim. This is a quote from Grant Cardone. He says, investors will step in to pick up single family homes at lower prices with less competition. And 
That being said, there will be no housing crash. Investors like myself will save the day and step in and buy the homes. Like, this just makes no sense, guys. Like, why would anybody, including Grant Cardone, come in and buy your property if it only went down 10% in value? To me, that seems pretty foolish. And this directly contradicts a story that we talked about last week that was from Redfin. And Redfin is reporting that investor home purchases went down by almost 50% last year, guys. So 45.8%, it went down in just one year. And that is such a huge drop in investor purchases that the last time we saw a decline like, like that was when? 2008. And it is no secret that investors have money set aside to buy up real estate when the downturn comes and prices get to a favorable amount for them. That part is true. Uh, it's estimated that there's about $110 billion sitting on the sidelines waiting to be deployed into the U.S. housing market from big investment firms like Grants, like uh, BlackRock and Blackstone and all these companies that you guys have heard of before. And while that is significant, it's also not. And let me just explain here what I mean. With this $110 billion, it's estimated that would add an additional 400,000 single family homes to the portfolios of these big hedge fund investors. And 400,000 homes does sound like a lot. But to put that into perspective, go watch my video from yesterday, guys, when we talked about the inventory increases that we're seeing right now. Just in January alone, we had 370,000 new homes hit the market in January of 2023. So when you put it into perspective like that, that's just one month's worth of inventory right now when it comes to all these investors supposedly out there waiting to buy these homes. So. While 400,000 sounds like a lot, that's one month's worth of added inventory in the US housing market right now. So over the course of a year, you're talking 1 12th of the homes being sold to investors, which is less than 10%. And that's also assuming they buy all 400,000 homes in one year, which you know they're not going to. So let me know what you guys think about this. Do you think that these investor home purchases are gonna have as massive of an impact? Do you think they're gonna come in and save the day like Grant Cardone says? I don't think so. And like I said, the reason why is simple. It just doesn't make good business sense, you know? Investors wanna get good deals and the cheaper they can pay for a property, the more of them they can buy. So them coming in anytime soon to buy up these properties just doesn't sound very likely, guys. I think a lot of these investment firms are gonna to wanna to see price drops on the order of 20% or more, which I define as a housing crash, to actually come in and start buying up real estate again. And here's the other thing. There's a lot of signs of trouble out there right now. It was just reported this week. Now that all of the COVID money and all the relief money has pretty much ended, it's putting a lot of Americans and American businesses into bankruptcy. Just in January alone, there was a 19% increase in bankruptcy filings just from a year ago. The bankruptcy filings just in January alone was a little over 31,000. And the amount of Americans filing for bankruptcy, which includes chapter seven, 11, and 13 bankruptcy, shot up 20% in January from a year ago. And why is this happening? Well, they're blaming it on inflation and people just not having the money, just like we've been talking about over and over again here. They're saying, you know, people were getting all this money for a couple of years in the form of pandemic relief funds. You had PPP loans, you had grants. There was all kinds of things that people were getting that they're not getting anymore. And some people are finally experiencing the economic crunch from this. And it's to the point where now they have to pay for their mortgage again. They got to pay for their car payments, their student loans, and they're just not able to right now. And we've already seen a ton of crypto companies file bankruptcy last year. The biggest one was FTX and that whole thing. And you also had regular companies like Revlon, the makeup company, they filed for bankruptcy. There was another one, Cineworld, which owns the Regal theaters. So the movie theaters aren't doing good right now. And so it's estimated that bankruptcy filings will likely to continue to rise throughout 2023. And if we go into a recession, which I think we already are in one, but when it becomes official, then that's just going to exacerbate the problems and going to increase the bankruptcy filings and the foreclosures and the defaults even more. And I have been saying this for months, guys, and 
every time I see this information come out, I'm sharing it with you guys because it just goes to show that this is really happening. I'm not making this stuff up. You can go and read all of this for yourself. And I'm going to tell you the truth here. Like the bankruptcy filings are still below pre-pandemic levels. So a lot of people will look at that and celebrate and say, oh, so it's still not a big deal, right? Because it's not as bad as it was pre-pandemic. But when you're seeing, you know, 19% increases in one month and just the first month of the year, that's a big sign of things to come. And they're saying that as you see more companies file for chapter seven bankruptcy, you're gonna see more services and more industries die and more jobs going away because of this. So this, this can also have a ripple effect throughout the economy where companies that used to be in business no longer are and they fire their entire labor force. Well, that's more people unemployed. That's more people that can't pay for things. It's more people that may need to default on a loan or potentially file bankruptcy. So you guys can see how all this is connected right now. But the silver lining with all of this is every time a company goes out of business or someone loses a house, it creates an opportunity for someone else, guys. And I don't mean to sound so opportunistic, but it's the truth. It's the truth that when a business goes under, there's another business that can come up and take its place. When someone loses their home to foreclosure, somebody else can come in, rehab that place, and make a profit on it. So as much as all of this sounds bad, it's gonna be bad for some and good for others. And that's just the way the cookie crumbles, you know? If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you click the bell notification down below YouTube will alert you every time I post a new video. And if you don't want to wait, check out my next one on the screen right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.